For more analysis, we are joined by Ian Johnson, Senior Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in Einar Tangen, a Senior Fellow at the Taiha Institute and also the Chairman of Asia Narratives. Uh, Ian, let me start with you first. Uh, there are looming concerns around the world right now about an, um, a new China COVID wave while Beijing promising normalcy within months. What's your sense of the situation in China right now and how much better or worse can it get? I think there's a lot of uncertainty in China based on my conversations with people inside China and, and looking also at social media and, and reports out of China. We sense that there's, um, after three years of the government micromanaging people's lives and telling them every couple of days to go get a test or various things like that, that suddenly there's this sort of void that a lot of people are in. Um, there isn't clarity on medicine. There seems to be their runs clearly on anti-fever medicines. There's concern in some cities about food. Um, food delivery companies have run out of many uh, the delivery people aren't there. And so I think there's a, a great uncertainty. And yeah, this could work out. Uh, and so after Chinese New Year, let's say things might be better. I'm sure they will be better. But exactly how quickly China returns to normalcy, I think, is still very much up in the air. Yeah, Aina, China was lauded for its efforts in containing the virus when it first emerged, from lockdowns to contact tracing to mobilizing healthcare response facilities. To date, its official death toll figure is still below 6,000, which is remarkable considering its population size. But it seemed incredibly organized in containing the virus compared to its plans to opening back up. Well, I, you know, clearly there was some pressure to change, but you know, you have to realize that uh, China moves very slowly. It's a bureaucracy, a tremendous emphasis on planning. So what China has been able to do is open up while uh, long after the COVID uh, first started. I mean, uh, there was disastrous results in the U.S. because they didn't have a plan in place. China, three years later, is uh, now at a point where it feels it can. Uh, exit the strict uh, strategies that it has. And so far, very, very successful. I mean, uh, unlike Ian, I actually uh, live in Beijing uh, and uh, have a fair amount of travel within China. I can tell you that um, there are always little pockets of areas where there's going to be problems. But overall, uh, everyone I've talked to, everything that I've seen uh, indicates that it's been a very, very smooth transition. People are a little bit concerned. Uh, about the, you know, they were they were frustrated by having all of these restrictions uh, when they were removed. Um, they became uh, a little bit frightened. So uh, a lot of people stayed off the streets. Obviously, uh, COVID was running through the area, um, but it's been very very mild. I've had it myself. In fact. <clears throat> prior to this time, I didn't really know many people who uh, had COVID um, who hadn't been abroad. Uh, now, I really don't know anybody who doesn't hasn't had COVID in the last two weeks uh, in Beijing, although it's a little slower spread in the outward areas. And I would agree with Ian <clears throat> that after Chinese New Year's, when you have this exodus of people going back to their hometowns, uh, that it will be complete. So China's uh, accomplished uh, getting, um, you know, exiting at a time when the virus is less lethal. And I think that's historically how they'll be remembered. And Einer, of course, we can also we can't also forget that the easing of restrictions were largely due to widespread protests across China last month, which were quelled after barely a week. But how would you assess how Beijing and also protesters play their cards there? And would it set a precedent that protests are the most effective way of pressuring the government? No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, quite frankly, the, the plans had been in place for quite some time. They were choosing uh, the right moment. Uh, obviously, the, from our the perspective here, what was the real catalyst uh, was the World Cup. Uh, Chinese people saw you know, throngs of people in the stands, no precautions, people on the, you know, on the field hugging and kissing each other and sweating. And, you know, of course, there's lots of shouting and things like that. And they had the sense that they were missing out on return to normalcy. As I said, there was a lot of frustration. But as soon as the government lifted all of these things, there was a lot of uh, concern. And uh, that considered, but this idea that there are long, long lines at fever clinics and hospitals are inundated is completely false. 
Uh, we can see that in uh, various uh, videos that are being taken by you know uh, random people as they go around. There's obviously a continued uh, disinformation campaign to make it look like things are about to collapse in China. But you know, as Ian uh, can tell you, you know the the China collapse theory has been around for 25 years, and each year it's been wrong. Well, Ian, if we turn to Taiwan, how would you characterize the events this year with regard? to the visit with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the unprecedented level of military activity that followed? I think this was one of these cases where the Biden administration probably didn't want Pelosi to visit, but didn't feel in the current climate in Washington where China is really where there's a bipartisan consensus against China that they didn't feel that they could speak up and ask her not to go. And so she went and, uh, you know, there was this unprecedented military uh, activity, but it was relatively limited. I mean, after about a week, it died down. I think China made its point. Um, nothing untoward happened. There were no planes shot down or ships sunk or anything like that. I think, though, that it is worrying to Beijing and, and also perhaps to the people in the administration who seek better ties that this kind of bipartisan con consensus is completely unchecked in Washington, where it's almost impossible to be uh, too hard line against China. So I think that in the coming year, we can probably expect the new Republican Speaker of the House, McCarty, he's likely to to visit at some point. And it's almost become now some uh, a de rigueur, a mandatory visit um, that one has to make to Taiwan. And Ian, if I can uh, shift your attention to the domestic economic front. Uh, last week, China's top leaders hinted at a pro-business shift, you know, loosening policies that have sort of sacrificed growth. Uh, what's your read on this apparently more pragmatic approach to economy? I mean, a sea change in the leadership's thinking or more of a tactical adjustment? Probably more of the latter, a tactical adjustment. I think Xi Jinping has been in power for 10 years and what you see is what you get, but I think that they are able to, the, the Communist Party has shown over the past, at least say 40 years or so, a certain amount of pragmatism, and they know that economic growth is important. Um, in China, just like in other countries, people um, are, are, are most affected by their wallet and uh, their livelihood, and so they realize they have to get growth back on track. Getting rid of zero COVID is part of that, for sure. I think that's probably, in my view, one of the biggest reasons why the uh, measures were dropped, um, just the, the declining economic output and slowing growth, etc. And so I, I do think they want to get things back on track, but I don't think you're going to see Xi Jinping morph into some sort of rabid free marketeer or somebody, say, along the lines of Zhu Rongji from 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago, who's pushing really super pro market reforms. I think he's still a person who believes that growth will come through increased and more efficient use of capital that the state can help guide. And I think that's probably still the overall uh, view in, in, in the leadership. Okay. And Ian, uh, sorry, I know your thoughts on China's economy. Well, you know, it continues to be a mix of socialist uh, ideas and uh, principles at the higher level and uh, capitalism at the lower level. You know, remember, um, this me uh, micro, small, medium-sized business entities make up, uh, you know, over 60% of the economy. They're 90% of new jobs, 80% of existing jobs, um, and they're they're really the key to the future. And I, I think the party is well aware of that. They were obviously uh, decimated. Uh, during COVID, um, but you know they're hoping that there will be a sharp V recovery, and that this will play into what they see as their long-term strategy, which is this dual circulation, as it's called. Basically, it's that uh, consumption within China will drive the economy, and uh, the fact that they both have markets and production uh, will be attractive to investment from outside of China. And they're still sticking to that. There's been no change. Uh, Xi Jinping is is. Uh, everyone likes to think of them as, as China is being driven by personalities. To a certain extent, it is, but not to the same extent that uh, you see in um, 
uh, d democratic societies where it's about popularity and uh, election and things like that. So uh, there's not going to be uh, much change. I would agree with Ian uh, on that. Uh, in terms of uh, opening up over COVID and the economic concerns, absolutely. I think that was a real concern. But keep in mind this idea that they didn't just suddenly say, oh, we're going to switch um, uh, early last year after um, uh, the last Chinese New Year, they started building in earnest uh, many emergency beds in uh, third and fourth tier cities, the smaller, more remote areas of China. And uh, that's been ongoing uh, since then. So there's been a lot of preparation going into this. There's a, I know a number of the people who are involved in the science side in terms of determining. And there was always this question about when do you open up? Uh, you know, the one party problem is always there. Uh, there's no place to hide. You can't say it was the other guy's fault. So they tend to be uh, cautious, sometimes overly so. <clears throat> and and Ian, uh, Xi Jinping's third term has begun. He surrounded himself with loyal uh, officials. What are likely to be Beijing's priorities once the COVID situation gets under control? Uh, will it be domestic or external? I tend to think that they have a number of issues on both sides. The top one probably in foreign affairs will be Taiwan, uh, making sure that things don't get out of control with an election coming up next year. Well, not next year, in tw early 2024, a little over a year from now in Taiwan. That will be a focus for sure over the coming year. But I think there are a host of uh, domestic challenges. Uh, they have to figure out what to do about the demographic situation and to make this economic vision work. Um, this economic vision of the state leading, uh, it's, it's a bit different than it was in the past. Of course, the state's always had a huge role in China, but under Xi Jinping, the state has, has sort of become more of a, almost like a venture capitalist trying to pick uh, big high-tech winners and losers. And I think that's going to be um, a, a challenge to make that work um, in, the, in the next few years. And gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and expertise this morning. We'll have to leave it there for now. We're speaking with Ian Johnson from the Council on Foreign Relations and Ina Tangen from Taiha Institute and Asian Narratives.